I've let you down And you feel more broken than whole When the wounds go deeper than words And you can't tell a soul I may not know what you're going through May not can make that high mountain move But one thing I found that I really want you to know If it matters to you It matters to the Master He wants to share the burdens you bear Whisper peace when your world gets shattered Scars of suffering 
brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. Yes, he did. His crown of thorns made me rose. His sorrow. But I live to tell that I made it through So instead of singing about the blues I bring you news to encourage you He's never failed me yet. Who in clouds and the valleys come Set your eyes on the Your heart be filled with light And watch the blessed day break the night Like the three Hebrew boys that day All forced to take their fate to flame I too have had the choice to break And serve the world instead But I stood on the word Lord, allow I came 
thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and forever. precious in my sight and honored and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, every one who is called by my name, who I created for your glory, whom I formed and made. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Mount Olive Seventh-day Adventist Church, where I pastor, and on behalf of the Southeastern Conference, President Dr. Michael Owusu, CFO Sister Cherie Brown, and yours truly, the conference secretary, we bring you greetings. We pray for our family as they are here. Dr. Martinborough was very close to us in our church. I have many fond memories of him. His laugh is one that will, will stick with me forever. And I think we shared that as we talked to the family. Just a few brief um, announcements before we get started. One, we, we are asking that we please stick to our, our program is, is, is nice, but it can be extensive. And so we're asking that we would follow the time limits as set forth there. I want you to also remind, be reminded of the fact that we're still in a COVID season. And we ask that you please be wary of that and uh, be cognizant of social distancing, wash your hands. As you can see, we have sanitizer and all of that here. Our program will be unannounced. All the participants know what they are going to do, and they will move forward. And uh, instead of a celebration of death, this is a celebration of life. Because we, we know that Christians don't die. They simply go to sleep, waiting for Jesus to call them, as he will, soon and very soon. May God continue to bless you, family. Our prayers are with you. We know God will get you through this, and we are here to support you any way we can. At this time, uh, Dr. Wilson is going to lead us in our song, our hymn, of work, our hymn of the day, All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
It was about May 1987, that's 34 years ago. Tiny man walked into my congregation, into the church, and someone said to me, it's that, the preacher for the crusade. We all look at him, we said we made a mistake. When he opened his mouth, he was so calm and quiet. We said we made a mistake. He led us in a night of prayer, and we did not make a mistake. Dr. Martin Borough came into my life and the life of my wife, Martha, at that time. He was the evangelist at Inter-American Division. He was trying out for the first time the Happy Family Life Crusade. So he tried it out in my district for the first time, back in the Colombian islands of San Andres and Providencia. It was the most outstanding crusade we had in the history of the islands. And we said to God, be the glory. He would come and eat at our table every day. And he just loved it. He, every morning he would say, Martha, I want my tea. And in the evening after he preached, Martha, I want my tea. Our little son, Steve, was there, just two years of age. And every time Pastor Martin Burrow would be coming, he would stand at the window to see him coming, but he could not say Martin Burrow. We said Pastor Martin Burrow. He would say, Daddy, boom, bo, boom, bo. And so Elder Martin Burrow would say, Stevie, boom, bo is here. For the next 34 years, we became family. He was not just a pastor and a mentor, but he became family to us, along with Sister Waveney. Every time we would see each other, we saw each other when I was president of the conference in Curacao, he came down and he preached evangelistic series for us, and he gave us the opportunity to have the final evangelistic series to try out again. He went to New York, to my district, and there he tried it out. Okay, so he was a great influence to us. He modeled discipline, commitment, perseverance, resilience. We want to say thank you, Jesus, for his life. Shall we all stand as we pray? Almighty God and eternal Heavenly Father, 
we ask a blessing upon this service. And we pray that your name may be exalted and magnified today. Just as you were during the life of Dr. Martin Burrow, whom we mourn today. We pray, Lord, that you may be with the service during this time of sorrow, yet we can rejoice that you have blessed us with his life. We will rejoice in every testimony, knowing that as your manservant, his life was a life well lived in service to you and to mankind. We ask your comfort for Sister Waveney, for Esther, for Samuel, for John, and the rest of the family. Be with them while they struggle in the darkness of grief. May they recognize joy in their memories, hope in their love, and peace in the pain that they are experiencing. Help them to sense your mighty presence today with them in this journey to recovery, filling the void of emptiness. Please give them the strength as they lay your son in his resting place here on earth with the full knowledge that soon Jesus will come to raise him for eternal life and to have a sweet reunion. May your blessing be upon us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon and welcome on behalf of the family. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or you are visiting with us online, we thank you for being here to celebrate with us. Thank you for celebrating the life of pastor, doctor, president, vice president, director, Gordon Martinborough. And I'm really not accustomed to referring to him in terms of those roles, but I know depending on when you've known him or worked with him or ministered with him, different ones of those roles may resonate with you. But among the family, different roles resonate. Among the family, he was husband and father and brother. And to me, he was my Uncle Gordon. So some roles he has left and can be filled again and have been filled again. Some roles won't ever be filled again. So we appreciate your support. We thank you for being here. Secondly, I'd like to acknowledge that I know that your support did not begin today. So the family has been blessed by your many acts of kindness. We thank you for all the cards, the calls, the social media posts, the text messages, the visits, and thank you for the food, for those of you who brought food. I wish there was something more that I could say beyond just thank you, but please know that your expressions of sympathy have been appreciated and we thank you with all of our hearts. Again, thank you for your support and thank you for being here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We came to funeralize him. We came to celebrate his life. We came to praise him. We came to bury him. We came to thank God for the ministry that he manifested in the life of Gordon Martin Burrow. That's why we are here. His life's focus was on the lives of those he encountered. He encouraged people dealing with death. He prompted to be in himself, to be involved in our lives. Jesus, when he was here on earth, he didn't have much to say about death, to do with death. He dealt with death in a very prompt manner. He met Jairus and raised his daughter. He met the widow of Nain and he stopped the funeral. And of course, we know he resurrected Lazarus. Those were the examples. And Jesus has left us something for us to all celebrate. I stand today as a representative of the countless young men and women who were nurtured, tutored, 
inspired and coached in ministry by Elder Gordon Martin Burrow. We used to say, Elder, I speak on behalf of Adam Sinclair, Liverpool, Gudge, Wilson, Wilson's, God, London, and George. These are some of those who, rep who I represent as I stand here today. In that number that I named, at least one of whom many may have said he is unfit for ministry. And Martin Borough looked at that potential disaster and said, leave him to me. I will pray him through to ministerial maturity. I stand here today to testify about what he did for me. Leadership has its challenges. Here is a man who had laid it all on the line for some of us to groom us and to develop us as young leaders. I had to be here today because I wanted to thank the family publicly. In my most recent, just under two years ago, darkest days of ministry, Pastor Martin Burr and his family stood by my side. And in the headstand next to my bed is a card right now written in his handwriting, his words of encouragement. That's the kind of guy he was in recent history in my life. So the official tributes are supposed to be two to three minutes. The remembrances are supposed to be five to eight minutes. The retirement years have been given appropriate, appropriate timing. We are here to celebrate the ministry and the moving to a higher ground, a higher plane. Something that would encourage us all as we press on the upward way. To gain new heights every day and still praying as we onward bound. We follow Pastor Martin Burr as he followed Christ to plant our feet on higher ground. We will all be able to sing with me, and when we are done, Lord, lift me up, and I shall stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant our feet on higher ground. That's what we're here to do, to celebrate his life, his growth in ministry. We will do that. Thank you all for listening. And thank you all for being attentive to what we're here to do. God bless you all.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to invite uh, Sister Rovina Hari Not, our conference treasurer, Guyana Conference, to please stand at this time. And Pastor Andrew Chichester, our personal ministries director and assistant to the president. We are happy to be here in person today to share with the Martin Boro family. Pastor Jamal Sanko, our executive secretary, could not be here because he's deputizing for me at a dedication service currently in progress on the west coast of Burbies. That's the Seafield Church. Thank you very much. You may be seated. At moments like this, I wish I can say like the preacher, allow me to take my time so I can finish on time. But that's not possible. Today, it is with a sense of deep honor that I rise on behalf of the Guyana Conference family to express heartfelt condolences to the wife, Sister Waveney, the children, Esther, Samuel, and John, and other grieving family members like the Magarils and the Shearers and other relatives who are crushed by the loss of one of our most dignified, devoted, dedicated, and distinguished sons of Guyana, whose life and leadership has advanced our conference to a place of respect and pride and has set in motion the administrative architecture for excellence in ministry, intentionality in evangelism, passion for mission, strategy in execution, willingness to sacrifice and fervency in prayer. When we review the stellar contribution he made as pastor, departmental direc director, and ultimately president, it would not be presumptuous to conclude like Shakespeare did when he said that some men are born great. You see, true greatness is not defined by what we gain, but by what we give. Gordon made it to the mountain top of success, but never left the valley of service. He was crowned with many titles, but always carried the menial towels. While his death has left a gaping hole in our lives, Pastor Martin Borrow has indelibly carved his name on our hearts. As a conference, we will remember him for many things, but we will never forget Gordon because he was extraordinarily gifted. He was strategically organized. He was classically resourceful. He was consistently devotional. He was preeminently original. He was proudly nationalistic. Many former administrators who would have been exposed to his leadership have concluded that as a leader, he was, he was in a class all by himself. Dr. Hilton Garnett confesses that he, was, he has never seen another leader so organized. Pastor Lyndon Gudge says he was a president who sets up sequences that had eternal consequences. Pastor Philip Bowman says he was a man of unbending integrity. Pastor Richard James says his greatest legacy was mobilization of the laity for evangelism. And Pastor Margaret Ramsran says he was a people person and a man of prayer. Brothers and sisters, the deposit he made into the Guyana Conference constituency to the day of his death will forever be immortalized in the annals of our history. May the calm, comforting, compelling, and captivating assurance we hold so dear be the anchor for the Martin Borough family in the days and years ahead that one day death will be swallowed up in victory. We look forward to that great reunion when ours will be the privilege of seeing this great stalwart, gifted servant, and gallant soldier of the cross in the earth made new. May we be faithful until that day.
opportunities extend condolences. We join nearly 7 million members and leaders. But in particular, on behalf of the President, Dr. Ellie Henry, the Treasurer, Elder Filiberto Vadusco. As I stand here today, looking at you, the Mattenboro family, and the other family members and friends who have come, there are two texts that come to my mind when I think about Pastor Mattenboro. The first is found in Hebrews, the 11th chapter and verse 4. It reads thus, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And though he be dead, he still speaks. When I think of Pastor Martin Burrow, he still speaks. And you say, how? Firstly, commitment to ministry. When you reflect on his ministry, you see commitment. He was not in the ministry because he couldn't find something else to do. He was in the ministry because he had been called and he valued that opportunity to serve. Secondly, I think of resourcefulness. In your program booklet, you receive a family life lesson. This man was used by God with his dear wife to develop resources for pastors, not only in family life, but to equip those of us in the Caribbean, the West Indies, and throughout the world. Thirdly, when I think about Pastor Martin Burrow, and you heard this already, he still speaks of the importance and the value of prayer. When it was my privilege to serve with him as an associate or the coordinator for his crusade many years ago in the Cayman Islands, I discovered that this man literally prayed for hours, literally. And that was the success of his ministry, a dedicated prayer life. So my final text, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, also verse 4 where the Apostle Paul says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Isn't that amazing? And I say that to you, Sister Martin Burrow, to you, Esther, your husband, to John, Samuel, and all the relatives. The God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. Wow, God is not limited. May you receive of his grace and of his comfort. And be assured, your friends, your colleagues, your people in the Inter-American Division will never forget the contribution that you have made. Inter-America today is what it is because of persons like Pastor Martin Burrow and you, Sister Martin Burrow. God bless you. And the Henry is praying with the others of us for you. On behalf of the Caribbean Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, my colleagues, Pastor Johnson Frederick, the Executive Secretary, and Pastor Bertie Henry, the Treasurer, and the other directors and leaders of the 10 fields, six conferences and four missions of the Caribbean Union. All the members who have heard and have been impacted by the life and influence of Dr. Gordon O. Martinborough, I convey to all of his family members, comfort, courage, and condolence in this time of loss. Dr. Martin Burrow has been an outstanding leader as a pastor in his own country of Guyana, also being president and provided outstanding leadership to the conference there. It is not surprising 
that Guyana is now our leading conference, our largest conference in the Caribbean Union. He also became the president of the Caribbean Union Conference and has impacted significantly the administration and leadership of the entire territory. He functioned as well at the Inter-American Division and we are always proud of his achievements. When we think of him and the work he has done, we feel proud to know that he is a son of the Caribbean soil. His greatest contribution has been in the area of evangelism, not only as an exponent as he preached the gospel and led thousands to the foot of the cross to accept Jesus Christ, but the materials he provided for laymen and for pastors alike. The Family Life Evangelism Series and the Health Evangelism Series have really impacted not only the Caribbean, but the world. We are proud of this Son of God who utilized his gifts and abilities to honor and glorify the name of Christ and to bring so many blessings to God's church. And so to his dear wife, Sister Waveney, we understand your grief and we feel this pain with you. May God continue to strengthen you to his children, Dr. Esther and her family, and Samuel and John. We know that this is a difficult time for you, but God will see you through it. To his dear sister, Dr. Shirley McGarrell and her family and all the other extended family members, may this time of loss be for you a time of reflection on the significant influence that Dr. Gordon Martin Burrow has brought to God and to his church. We know that weeping will endure for the night, but joy will come in the morning. And even though he is sleeping in Jesus, we are confident that his work will follow him. May God bless us all at this time of loss. I dreamed of a city called glory so bright and so few as I entered the gates I cried holy mm -hmm. the angels all met me there they carried me from mansion to Then I say, I want to see my Jesus.
heats of that city. that we will be within the limits. You may not see my name there, but that is not important. I stand here today representing the Great Northeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventist. And there are more people from Guyana in the Northeastern Conference only next to those who were born and those who are living there now. The Martin Brewers are loved by those of us in Northeastern Conference. The president of the conference would have been here, Dr. Honore, but he's at another funeral now, of President Fordham in the Allegheny East Conference. Uh, the ministerial director would have been here because Pastor Martin Borrow ordained him, that's Ainsworth Joseph, Dr. Ainsworth Joseph. He is in Trinidad right now for the funeral of his sister's uh, husband that died suddenly. 
So the president decided I need to send the prayer coordinator uh, for the conference and one of the ministers from the Northeastern Conference. I had the privilege of meeting the Martin Burrs when we were doing family life ministry at Andrews. And I am a richer person and everyone that has been touched by the Martins. Pastor Carl, where you're looking at me and giving me the eye. He's another of Northeastern's finest, the executive secretary for this lovely uh, conference. You see, they're all warning me because they know I can be long, but I shan't today. Amen. We had uh, the joy of having Pastor Martin Burr when one of our conference, uh, one of our churches was facing a dilemma. There were three people I took to the church, and they're all now baptized members of the church because of the finesse, the beauty, and the wisdom and the love of the late uh, Dr. Martin uh, Borrow. We in Northeastern, the president said, make sure you say this. That was the last workers' meeting that we had, and our guest speaker was none other, Dr. Waveney, than uh, Dr. Martin Burr. Esther, your uh, daddy, John, and uh, Samuel, and what a time that was. We were hoping to have him back with us next year, but that will not be. And so our sympathy comes from the administration, the directors of the conference, and the membership of Northeastern Conference. And as I walk away, Isaiah 57 gives us a reminder that the righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering the evil to come. God has allowed my friend, my prayer partner, to go to sleep for a little while. And those of you that have not gotten Dr. Waveney's book, every Adventist around the world needs to get that book, that love story. Can I hear an amen? And recommend it to the world. Precious in the sight of Jesus is the death of his saint, and he was a saint. God bless you. Love you. Good afternoon, everyone. I've asked God to work a miracle through me to speak of Dr. Martin Burr's early years in what, five to eight minutes. It's, I'm praying God to help me to do work that miracle. Puxi was his youthful alias. Only his home folk and a few friends who knew this name, which he outgrew as the years fled by. We met for the first time in 1947, when his father, Gordon Sr., now resting, a police corporal was transferred from one district to another district, and that other district is our village, the Buxton Friendship Village, east coast of Marara in Guyana. The Martin Burr family chose the Buxton Church as their church since it was near to their father's workplace. We became friends. He was 11 years of age and I was 14. 
On many occasions, he rode his father's bicycle to come to visit me, and vice versa, I would walk the near mile to visit him. At the tender age, I took note that Gordon was a serious child who loved the following, God and his holy word, the Bible, God's book, nature, efforts to bring people to Jesus Christ. He loved Bible studies. And to talk about prayer, before the term prayer warrior became current, Gordon Martinborough was a prayer warrior. For his entire life, there was an awesomeness about his relationship with God, a vivacious camaraderie which gave birth to extended conversations in prayer, voiced with intensity, yet mellowed by profound respect and deep affection for his Lord. His leadership skills blossomed very early, and the little church at Buxton took note of this and elected him the youth leader, we said the MV in those days, missionary volunteer, while we speak today of Adventist youth, youth ministries. As superintendent of the Sabbath school, he and I work closely together. He is the youth leader. As friends, Gordon and I formed a team. We went out to give Bible studies after the entire youth society would move along, serving tracks to the neighborhood around the village, and would follow up with Bible studies for those who desired so. We had good times. Having been Gordon's senior by three years and huskier in frame, he looked to me as a big brother and asked me to teach him things. One, swimming lessons. He said, Roy, please teach me to swim. I tried my best. <laughs> After secondary school, I got my first job in the hinterland of Guyana. Colloquially, we say the bush. And I, nature was so enthralling that I wrote a poem and sent a copy of it to the girl I was admiring, Gordon's sister, Shirley. She's right here with us this evening. The Lord led and after 59 years of marriage and still counting, we are together. Amen. When I came from the bush, Gordon said to me, Roy, please, I saw the poem you sent to Shirley. Please teach me to write poetry. <laughs> so I gave him a crash course. We talked about meter and rhyme, the heroic couplet. Next, we talked about the blank verse high and beautiful thoughts expressed without rhyme. Like, for example, Shakespeare's words in from Othello, who steals my purse steals trash, but he that filches me from my good name, robs me of that which not enriches him, and leaves me poor indeed. The upshot, Gordon, consistent with his brilliant mind, began to compose poetry better poetry than I composed. <laughs> to give verity to the statement, the student has outrun the master. Just a quick little peep at one of his poems, a short one. Now dies the light some day, he's talking about sunset. Now dies the light some day, and golden sunset crowns its parting hours. And the sweet breezes whisper a melody of peace, and darkness hastens on. Oh, pardon me. And darkness hastened on. But shall the precious gems of truth this day revealed flee with yon setting sun? Oh, may their joyous radiance ever with you stay as on you go along life's dark, uneven way to sweet your life, to light your care, and guide someone, somewhere. Gordon Martin Burrow, 1958. I played a little bit for our church at Buxton, 
And Gordon said to me, Roy, you must teach me music. <laughs> we began music lessons in our little organ at home, but because of his myriad activities and overweighted schedule, his attendance for lessons became less and less, which robbed him of the opportunity to advance in the art. Other activities as boys, young men, we taught at the same school. He began there before me. I left the bush after he was taken on at that school to teach, Enmore Government School. I was asked to go there also. I said, maybe God didn't want us to be separated. The school is about four miles from our home, and riding our bicycles every day, five days per week, and discussing various subjects of all types, it grew and grew with respect to the friendship and the togetherness between the two of us. We resigned from that school and entered into matriculated into CUC, now the University of the Southern Caribbean. There were no jobs when we got there, and so they said the only positions that were opened was on the farm. So we went to the farm. We labored on the farm for the first quarter or semester, and after that quarter, administration called us to teach. Gordon taught Bible from forms one to three, and I from forms geography from the same three forms. He was so tied with his books, church work, writings, devotional exercises that he had no time to play, no time to relax. I played cricket, table tennis, looked at cycle sports, and so one day I said to him, come with me to the cricket match with Guyana, not Guyana, the West Indies, playing against India. Come with me. And he came along, and he really, really enjoyed it. His laughter. Yet there was a lighter side. Have you ever heard Gordon Martinborough laugh? <laughs> His was a thunderous, bellyful, mirthful exuberance. <laughs> a sweet, tasty gufa. <laughs> but we have feet of clay. All of us have feet of clay, and my friend Gordon was no exception. One of the things we did in the Buxton MV Society was Mother's Day concert yearly, and Gordon was leading out. One of the concerts was so beautiful that he said we must take it to the city. And he was asked the youth leader of the city to help us in sending out invitations, etc. I said to him, let us speak to the pastor first and get permission from the pastor to speak to the youth leader. He said, no, no, not necessary. I did not push against it. I said, OK. And we went, and the youth leader was very accommodating and agreed to, uh, to help us with the program. When we left talking with the youth leader, the pastor of the church was waiting for us at the exit door. <laughs> and these were his words, young men, how dare you come into my church to have a meeting with my church officer? without contacting me. Even though, Lord, we kept our poise, exhibited calm, and apologized. Did I tell my friend Gordon, I told you so? <laughs> no, of course not. I was sure, however, that he got a lesson out of it. Maybe the pastor was touched by our humility since he volunteered to take us to the city center to get a taxi to take us back to our home village. Several years later, I met that pastor in company with other pastors. In the lobby of a hotel, we were to stay awaiting the start of the Cleveland Crusade. And when I left the company, I overheard the pastor saying, you see that young man, McGarrell, and another one, Gordon Martinborough, they are going to go far in this organization. Well, Gordon became conference president. He became union president. He went on to division. I veered to education, went to Andrews, and then went to our University of the Caribbean as dean of the School of Theology and professor of theology. Dr. Gordon, Gordon Martin Barrow is a great man. It was an honor for me to have him as my best friend and my playmate, and not only a friend, but also as my brother-in-law. We look forward in time 
God helping us to be able to meet him by and by when Jesus comes to spend together the ceaseless ages of eternity. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, our hearts are broken as we reflect on the passing of Pastor Gordon Martin Burrow. I would describe him as a leader, a visionary, and a man of great compassion. Our paths crossed when I returned from, to Guyana after completing my studies at Caribbean Union College. I can truly say Elder Martin Barrow was like a father to me. My first assignment was to be a special assistant to his office. And in that vein, he assigned me to work in the Sabbath School Department. Pastor Martin Barrow from day one, exhibited exemplary leadership skills. He can best be described as a servant leader. Greenfield has captured these characteristics so beautifully. He was a listener. He was empathetic. He showed interest in your health and well-being. He was always aware of what was going on around him. He did everything with such finesse. He showed the element of persuasion in what he was doing. He was a great thinker. He was a man of great foresight. He exhibited stewardship, and his main contribution was that he sowed in the lives of younger workers, and for that, I am eternally grateful. I remember vividly when we met the very first day, that was my first day on the job, and our meeting was at 10 o'clock. He welcomed me into the office family, and before he began the meeting, Elder Martin Burrow prayed. I must testify that as I listened to Elder Martin Barrow, I was transported into the throne room of God. This prayer was so beautiful. It was so touching. It epitomized someone who had a dynamic relationship with God. He was a prayer warrior and a leader with impeccable spiritual connection with God. As we began the meeting, he did not focus on the work. He wanted to hear my story because I guess he knew as a leader that if he understood me and where I was coming from and my story, then he can sow even more into my life and make me the quality leader God intended for me to be. And so I thanked him very much. As he listened with keen awareness, he I guess was saying to himself, this is someone who is teachable, who is coachable, and who God can use to be a good leader, and I thank him. He was a strategic leader. Elder Martin Burrow never did anything willy-nilly. Everything was precise. Everything was so impeccably thought out and executed. And I learned very early in my career that if I followed Elder Martin Barrow, I was going to go in the right direction. My thoughts can right now go to our very first 
convention. We had conventions all over the country. And our first convention was at the Cultural Center. I remember because I was a shy person, I gave my presentation and I kept looking down at my paper. Monday morning, Elder Martin Burroughs said, Jan, you did a phenomenal job, but you never looked at the audience. And that was the beginning of my coaching lesson on how to speak and to look at the audience and how to project my voice. And today, I am grateful that he spent the time to help me to develop such a skill. He was thoughtful, insightful, a team builder, a Christian leader who understood his calling to evangelism. He was a great administrator that sowed into the lives of many of us like Horatius and Colwick and the likes. I can say truly, Elder Martin Barrow understood the dynamics of evangelism because he coupled health evangelism with the actual promulgation of the gospel. And he engaged Pastor Colin Parkinson, myself, and Malcolm Court in writing these lessons. Elder Martin Barrow was also interested in human capital because very early in our career, he made sure that Malcolm, Colin, and myself were able to pursue our master's degree in public health so that we can continue to make the contribution to the conference. I can say, what a leader, what a man, what a servant. He was selfless. He was one who loved us, and even when we made mistakes, he never chastised us, but he showed us how to do better. And so, as I reflect on this great man of God, I say, sleep on, great soldier, leader par excellence, take your rest. We look forward to the great reunion when Jesus comes. To Sister Waveney, Esther and Marco, Sammy and John, Sister Shirley and family, and Sister Dolly and family, and the extended family, we are going to keep on praying for you. But do not sorrow as those who have no hope. We have the blessed hope. And I'm assured Jesus is soon to come, and I'm looking forward to seeing my dad, my leader, my coach, my friend, Pastor Gordon Martin Barrow. God bless you. Good afternoon. This is our loss. I am family, and so to all of you, we grieve. I became an integral part of the Martin Burroughs family when both of us were elected to the administration of the Guyana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He is president, and I, as the Striplin secretary of the conference. I was a youngster, but he never made me feel that way. But you know, the inevitable happens. And you lose your friend, you lose your mentor, you lose your confidant. The inevitable happens. Despite the longevity of our biblical heroes, the repetitive summary of their lives 
recorded in Genesis chapter 5, is a grim reminder of the temporal nature of our surgeons here. Adam lived 930 years, and he had sons, but he died. Seth lived 912, and he died. Enos, 905, and he died. In every instance, though, punctuated between this story is the history of their progeny. That serves as an example to us that legacy matters. And this man has left us a legacy. Too often in our times, the work, the labor, the sacrifice of our leaders are so easily forgotten. And I pray and thank God that we would remember the many exploits of this great man of God. In a speech sometime back, I asked, where is the biography of G. Ralph Thompson? Why isn't the wonderful sermons of our speaker today circulating among the youngsters so that we can benefit from their walk with God? Of course, his presidency cannot be encapsulated in eight minutes. Elder, my mentor and other mentor, <laughs> Dr. McGarrell, prayed for all of us. So I'm going to spend time with just three aspects of his ministry. First is organization. Dr. Martin Barrow was organized to the nth degree. He was an intellectual giant and know how to blend theory with pragmatism. He was an ardent believer in management by objectives, and this informed the plans of the conference, informed his expectations of his pastors and departmental leaders, he expected and demanded a plan with measurable outcomes for everyone. Everything he did emanated from a reproducible plan. But the scholar in him did not allow him to simply see management by objectives as simply the identification of goals, objectives, plans, and outcomes. His innovation transformed the concept to reflect his deep commitment to his belief in prayer. And so in the first year of his presidency, he developed what was called the prayer objectives. And he created the prayer objective calendar. That was his unique way to remind us the divine guidance and intervention was necessary to succeed in the work of God, irrespective of the organizations of what we do. He taught us to pray. And I remember that in the first year, some of those objectives were met in the very month we prayed. There were always 12 or more divided into months. Well, Martin Barrow came to committee 
well prepared. Every item was discussed ahead of time. You had an item on the agenda and you had to meet with Go. That's what we used to call him. Yeah. G.O. Martin Barrow. He was always prepared. He studied the possible questions, asked them himself, raised objections. And I thank him because I took his principle of leadership with me wherever I went. And God has taken me places. I served as president of a, a university and in every other administrative position along the ladder. And I've never forgotten Elder G.O. Martin Barrow. Secondly, his transparency. We all know that some aspects of our Adventist administration is shrouded in secrecy. Well, Martin Borough took to the presidency at a time when it was very difficult. I remember distinctly our tight income was just about 700,000. Called us together, we sat together, and he said this veil of secrecy, as he called it, has to be removed. He said, this organization, these monies, everything belong to the people and they need to know about it. So he took to the road. And you would recall all of those district conventions that we did. And it was to provide the people the knowledge of the operations the objectives of the conference. And you know something? In just about a year and a few months, what we feared, the opposite happened. The tight income rose above a million for the first time in the history of the conference simply because the people knew, the people understood the needs and they responded. I can talk about how he fostered and supported me in developing the district development idea. He saw that coming together meant more than being separated. And so he helped me push districts to pool resources together to get projects done even though you have to wait your turn to do it. This man was inspired. And lastly, I just want to say a few words about his humanity. Elder Martin Barrow was truly a man of God and loved and cared for the people he worked for and the family of God in the Guyana Conference. My early introduction was through my mother, who he baptized. His family ministry grew out of his caring for the well-being of families and others. He paid individual attention to all of us, Every one of us who worked for him would remember an individual, extensive meeting with this man of God. I came into the office one Monday morning and saw him in deep sorrow. A worker had gotten sick, and he was aggrieved that the worker would not come to the hospital. He said, Leon, I'm, I'm worried about, I almost called his name. <laughs> was that Giddings? Yes, it was. <laughs> and he said, I sent messages. He would not come. So I told him, don't worry. <laughs> I'll see you this afternoon. I drove up the road. 
pulled up at Giddings' house. I said, Gitz, come on, let's go, man. You got to go to the hospital. This man of God, Elder Giddings, is a product of Martin Burroughs' caring. We all are products of his caring. Sister Martin Burrow, Esther, Johnny and Sammy, and your families. I'm forever a part of your family. You can do nothing about it. May God comfort you in this time.
Behind every innovation is an architect. A bold move was made by Pastor Gordon Martin Borough to organize a chapter of the Adventist Laypersons Services and Industries, ASI, in the territory of the Inter-American Division, IAD. Such an organization of laypersons existed only in the North American Division of the Adventist Church. So, it was the vision of Pastor Martin Barrow, when he served as the Vice President of the Division, to bring together Adventist business and professional persons and artisans into a single association with a motto of sharing Christ in the marketplace, that is, in the places where they work. The geographical territory of the Inter-American Division includes Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and the five countries on the South American continent, namely Colombia, Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, and Venezuela. To share his vision, Pastor Marion Barrow sent out a summary of what ASI is all about and an invitation to selected business and professional persons and organizational leaders to a meeting scheduled for April 16, 1998 at the headquarters of the Inter-American Division in Coral Gables, Florida, with the caveat that each attendee would be responsible for his or her own expenses. 20 persons attended the meeting, including the then president of the division, Elder Israel Leito, and the current president, Dr. Ailey Henry, who then represented Haiti. At the meeting, the benefits of an ASI chapter in our division territory was outlined. A draft constitution was adopted, officers were elected, and a movement was born. His vision moved into action. The first convention and business expo of ASI into America was held in Kingston, Jamaica during August of 1999. It was a great success. There are now chapters of ASI in many unions and in many local fields across the territory of Inter-America. The 20th anniversary of the inauguration of ASI in Inter-America was the highlight of the 2018 Convention and Business Expo held in Cancun, Mexico. Dr. Martin Borough wanted to attend, but could not because of other pressing engagements. However, he wrote a letter to the convention participants, which reads in part, Dear friends, it is hard to believe that 20 years have gone by since the birth of ASI in the Inter-American Division. I carry pleasant memories of organizing chapters in the various unions, conferences, and missions of IAD. I also remember the very first ASI convention of the division held in Kingston, Jamaica, August 12, 215, 1999. There we were honored with the presence of the Governor General of both Jamaica and Antigua. It is very easy for an organization to host a great convocation, he said, but lose its sense of mission. Let us never forget that our motto is sharing Christ in the marketplace. Motivate each ASI member and each member organization to take effective action to reach the business and professional persons in your community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. End of his letter. His memory will live on through ASI into America. In this life, we can only say thanks and express appreciation for his momentous contribution, but his reward is reserved in heaven to be presented by Jesus Christ himself. That will be a glorious day.
。アーメン。Gordon Martinborough was one to agree that beside, not behind every good man, is a good woman. As such, he teamed with his wife Waveney and together worked as Family Life co-directors of Inter-American Division. Our work was cut out for us because one of the focus issues of the General Conference for the quinquennium 2000 to 2005 was the family. We chose the theme, empowering every family for time and eternity. Then, to identify the needs of the multicultural families of IAD, we enlisted the expertise of the doctors Leon and Colwick Wilson to prepare the survey instrument and tabulate the results. We then chose 14 of the most pressing needs and equally prepared the lessons. We then traveled to 16 unions of the division by air and by land, sometimes all night and day, to train the couples in leadership. At the end, each union director had a total of 15 presentations on worksheets in English, French, Spanish, and a CD with graphic illustrations. And with the challenge to faithfulness under God ringing in their ears, the leadership couples returned to their fields and rallied to the task. Did we have controversy as a couple in ministry? Of course we did. That was when love found the way. When we retired and moved to Florida, we were able to present family life evangelism to family life or family life education to conferences in the South, New York, Carolinas, ministerial conferences in students, uh, in, at Andrews University, several churches in Florida, including Forest Lake. As for me, I enjoyed Gordon's spirit of adventure, admired the twinkle in his eye when he smiled. I liked his energy and his endearing love for me that brought out my love for him. But most of all, I am blessed by his love for God and the desire to share him with others. Gordon Ornsley, G.O., as I fondly call him, I will surely miss you. Looking forward to the resurrection. Indeed, there is no limit to the usefulness of one who puts self aside makes room for the workings of the Holy Spirit on his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. Young pastor, young woman, young man, why not be that one? We
Happy Family Bible Seminars International was set up by Gordon and Waveney Martinborough as a global center for Christian leadership. It began as an interactive family life education program that provided not only live seminars, but also as an online source where church leaders and its members could download seminar materials with the view of evangelism based on family life. On September 12, 2005, Happy Family Bible Seminars was registered with the state of Florida as a nonprofit 501c3 organization and began expanding its ministry to North America, Canada, Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, and the Caribbean. Today, in addition to the Family Life series, you can find on the website hfbsi.org a brand new healthy and happiness series is found that can be used as a health evangelism series. For the past 20 years, Elder Martinborough and his wife, Waveney Martinborough, have conducted annual evangelistic campaigns in addition to countless seminars and weeks of prayers. Because of their efforts and the hundreds of pastors and lay people that have utilized the programs, there have been tens of thousands of baptisms. As a treasurer of Happy Family Bible Seminars for the past 18 years, I can recall the early days when the Martinboroughs, after having invested their life savings into startup operations to purchase equipment and materials, you know, their home was the production center. It was the warehouse, it's the shipping point, and it still remains so today. Those were challenging times when the small income from the sales of materials did not cover the monthly operational expenses. However, after 2005, when Happy Family Bible Seminars became a 501c3 entity and could accept public donations, the finances of this small organization began to improve. It was astounding to see how the Lord blessed the small organization as it became a global operation. We were able to obtain two major grants which allowed us to produce two series, a daily fit activity series that traces the life of a person from the time waking up through daily activities to rest at night. The second series, which is more current, is a health series available also on the website alongside the original Family Life series. Le Martinborough was never one to sit back on his accomplishments and he was already planning a third series that revolved around family financial planning. I should point out that in all the series, there was a second major component, and that was based on the Bible. So the ultimate mission was, and is always, evangelism. In conclusion, the highest tribute that I can pay to the founder and director of HFBSI Elder Martinborough, is that his good works not only follow him, but will continue to harvest souls for the kingdom. Amen. Elder Martinborough will hear the words, well done, now good and faithful servant.
Well, 
what can we say? But that we will bless the Lord at all times, that his praise will continually be in our mouths, for great has been his mercy towards us. And although weeping will endure for, may endure for a night, joy will indeed come in the morning. I stand today on behalf of my family to pay tribute to my father. But before I do so, I just wanted to say thank you again and to express our profound gratitude for the tremendous outpouring of love and support. It has really been for us a tremendous comfort, your calls, texts, emails, cards, visits, food, donations, gifts, posts, poetries, odes, all of your kindness has been so tremendously um, comforting to us. We want to thank um, those of you who spent the time with us at the Outstanding Wake last night, and also for your presence um, here in person today, some of you traveling from long distances, braving the pandemic to be present. Uh, we also thank them for those who have been with us online. Our hearts are overflowing with gratitude. And now for the tributes. You know, when we touched down in Guyana, little did we know that our lives would be forever changed. I was 10 at the time. My brother Sam was nine, and John was three. And it was the dizzying traffic, the spicy street food, the British education system, the rich diversity of peoples, blacks, East Indian, Amerindians, Asians, and the, ever, the, and the even richer culture that made this really an exciting time for us, a time of adaptation, a time for exploration, and a time for growth. If, however, one was going to pick a time to return to Guyana, this would not have been the time. Guyana was ruled by a dictatorship. The communist system designed to ensure equality only oppressed the poor. It seems like no political system really works well. There were extreme shortages of the very basic of necessities, such as flour and oil. And into this difficult political and financial situation, my father brings us and our family. But he was undaunted in his purpose. The more difficult the situation became, the more innovative and creative he became. The more chaotic the circumstances, the more strategic was his planning, and the deeper his level of organization. If Burnham had an army with guns, my father knew that God would raise up for himself an army armed with workers and materials in their hands, an army more powerful and invincible. And for this he worked, he organized, he trained, and and he prayed. Later in life, after he learned Spanish, he would find the word to describe his passion and his approach. It was adelante, which means to move forward, to advance. As my dad's responsibilities grew and we became more settled, my brother Sam and I declared that we wanted a church home. And to our shock and delight, our parents agreed, and to Carmel we went. We thought our ingenious plan to get out from under the watchful eye of our parents had succeeded. However, little did we know that we came under the watchful eye of Brother J.B. Innes and the anointed leadership at Carmel. And the church became a training ground for us young people. And looking back, I am amazed because we were teenagers, and yet we were given the opportunity to lead. We were given the opportunity to sing our songs, a space to make mistakes, a space to laugh, a space to learn, and a space to be. Looking back, it was clear that this mentorship and guidance was not accidental, but intentional. And it was the hallmark, as you've heard, of my father's leadership to invest the time to guide, train, and educate, especially young people, for life and for service. 
And the same care he took for us, his children, as you've heard, he also took for young ministers, workers, and leaders alike. And so many of us can testify that he touched us, and we have grown. His loving care was lifelong. But I went to Switzerland to study and returned with someone wonderfully unexpected. When Sam stepped out to form Missing Links, a nonprofit targeting inner city school children, when Marco founded a nonprofit for tropical and neglected diseases, when John switched careers to become a singer, songwriter, and activist, my dad was there, counseling, listening, praying, whispering, Atalante. My parents' love story is like a fairy tale. My dad coming to the women's dorm with chocolate in his hand on the day of my mother's birthday, just as she was praying for a sign. And they did live happily ever after, this, <laughs> despite, what did you call it, mommy? The controversies? Despite the controversies, and they were deeply in love, soulmates and partners in ministry. My parents walked hand in hand on every level, and I know some of you have seen them walking hand in hand physically. And because of this, our home was filled with laughter, with love, with poetry. Thank you, Uncle Roy. And with unique insights into God. My dad was a great man, but his achievements would have been impossible without the love, input, direction, support, and prayers of my mother. But the relationship my dad treasured over all his other relationships was his relationship with God. God spoke to my father, not in the whisperings that I sometimes hear, but in a clear voice and face to face. He, every morning at 4 a.m., my father would get up and spend the hours with God in prayer, in meditation, and in study of the Word. And it was there that all of these plans that we've heard about today were developed. There were days when my father would exit his study and his face would be literally aglow. He had been in the presence, and there's no limit the usefulness of one who is so wholly consecrated to God. And finally, at the end of his life, victory, my family is intensely private. But we wanted to share one of his struggles with you in the hope that it will help someone. My father suffered from two bouts of severe depression. The first after his retirement from the IAD, and the second after the start of COVID. Both difficult times for a man whose initials are GO. To those who suffer from depression or any other illnesses of the mind, and for those who support them, please know that we stand in solidarity with you because it's rough. Someone characterized depression as being at the bottom of the ocean alone, feeling that no one could reach you, not even God. And for someone who spoke to God face to face, you can imagine the torture of not being able to clearly hear God's voice. I know it sounds like evil triumph here, but it is not so. My father recovered from his first depression, and with intense prayers, yes, and also with the appropriate medication and with Christian therapy, and he went on to 15 years of the Happy Family Bible Seminars. And on the morning of his passing, he spoke with a voice strong and clear. I want you to know, he said, I want you to know I'm okay. I'm okay now. And then he passed peacefully in the arms of my mother. And that, my friends, is victory. So I know that we will see my father again, 
I think we'll recognize him by his laugh, don't you think? Because <laughs> I think that no angel or no person living, dead, or yet to come will ever be able to mimic the joy of his laughter. The excellency of his life requires a re-evaluation of our own. We need to be undaunted in our purpose. We need to be intentional, not only in our ministry, but in our mentorship. We need to create wide, open, encompassing spaces, especially for young people dedicated to bringing up our game with respect to strategic planning and technology and innovation. These difficult times require it. Will you commit with me to love more, to laugh a whole lot more, and to deepen the relationship with him who is the author and finisher of our faith? If so, then surely goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy. It's a beautiful pairing, isn't it? Goodness and mercy. They will follow you and they will follow me all of the days. The good days and the days like today all of the days of our lives, and then we will dwell. <laughs> we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever 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 Amen. And so when thou walkest through the water, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And then when thou walkest through the fires, thou shalt not be burnt. Adelante. Wow, I can't believe this. This is our fourth loss in our family since October. And uh, my Uncle Gordon, uh, he's been always there for me in uh, significant milestones and has been an inspiration for me in his ministry that he and my Aunt Waveney have been doing with um, trying to make families stronger in their books and, and research and, and things that they've done, which has really inspired me in my own work. And I'll never forget his laugh. <laughs> you know, he has this real deep, hearty, you know, once he starts, you know, you can't help but laugh with him. And so to my cousins, um, Sammy, Johnny, and Esther, and to my aunt, and Waveney, you know, if you've lost a father and you've lost a loved one, but I hope that through my song that you will be reminded that we have a heavenly father who will never leave us. A father who will always care for every little detail, who will be there for us as long as we put him first and who already knows what we need. And a heavenly father that's so powerful that, no, that not even death can, has the final say. Praise God, may you be blessed.
Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Central Florida chapter of the Alumni Association of the University of the Southern Caribbean Union, I express to you, Waveney, and to the members of your family, our deep sorrow over the loss of our friend and supporter, Gordon Martinborough. He served once as a chaplain of this organization. Now, more years than I care to remember, actually, 61 years ago, I was a teacher at Caribbean Union College, and Gordon was a student in one of my classes. I have followed his progress over the years. I spent the next 40-something years in Chicago and followed his progress. He was a, a great man, and it's my privilege to summarize his obituary as written on the program that you have. Gordon Martinborough was born on November 12, 1936 to Gordon Sr. and Maisie Martinborough in Georgetown, Guyana. He demonstrated responsibility at an early age by his willingness to assist in the care of his younger siblings, Patrick Shirley and Dolly. Even of a child, he was very spiritual and happily participated in church activities. He completed a theology course at the Caribbean Union College, now University of the Southern Caribbean, in 1961, and returned to serve in the Guyana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists as a pastor. Gordon, and fellow student Waveney Hines, while at CUC, developed and nurtured a powerful bond of affection that resulted in marriage in April 17, 1963. They have been partners in ministry and happily married for 58 years. Amen. Pastor Martinborough was a very innovative and effective evangelist, as you know. He baptized thousands in Guyana and wrote sermon outlines that were used by both ministers and lay people. He lost his voice in 1971 because of his heavy speaking schedule, and he went to Loma Linda Hospital for treatment. While there, he completed a BA in religion and history and an Emmy in church history. His thesis is considered a standard reference for researchers in Adventist studies. In 2118, the University of the Southern Caribbean conferred on him an honorary doctor of religion. He returned to Guyana after Loma Linda and was elected president of the conference in 1980. In 1991, he was elected president of the Caribbean Union. His contributions to USC as chairman of the board of directors, the union president is the chairman of the board of directors, his contributions are phenomenal. 
In 1995, he was elected vice president of the Inter-American Division, where he served until his retirement. In 2005, he and his dear wife founded Happy Family Bible Seminars International, where they brought an innovative brand of evangelism to the global community. These programs have been widely viewed on 3ABN, Hope TV, Loma Linda Broadcasting Network, and Safe TV. Dr. Martin Burr's books and materials have been translated into more than five languages and used extensively in the Caribbean, both North and South America, Korea, the Philippines, and other places. Even though his many accomplishments, even through his many accomplishments, pioneering efforts, and outstanding leadership, Gordon was a humble man who placed ministry on others above himself. He departed this life peacefully on July the 8th, 2021, in the arms of his beloved wife, Waveney, and surrounded by the voices of his children, his sister, and his best friend, Dr. McGarrell. He's a shining example of what God can do with lives that are surrendered to him. Gordon is preceded in death by his parents and a brother, Patrick. He is survived by his wife, Waveney, and three children, Dr. Esther Biamonte and her husband, Marco, sons Samuel and John, a sister, Dr. Shirley Martinborough and her husband, Roy, a sister, Dolly Teixeira and her husband, Teixeira, and a host of cousins, nephews, and nieces. We thank God for the life, ministry, and service of Gordon Martinborough. Thank you. 
Hallelujah. Ten thousand joys. Before I get into my homily, I'd like to extend, uh, first of all, my profound sympathy, condolences, prayers, and love to dear Waveney and the family. And I wish all of you who join us here today to remember that we are here for a very special purpose. And that purpose is not to lament the passing of our beloved brother and friend. We are here to celebrate his life. I want to congratulate all of you who have helped to plan this service for the simple reason that from the start until now, it has been a service of celebration. Yeah. Celebration. You see, when we come together as believers in Christ, regardless of the nature of the function, we come together because we have a single goal in our minds, a purpose. We know where we have come from, why we are here, and where we are going. And in this service, I am glad that you have chosen to have a celebration of Gordon's life. Amen. That's what he would have wanted, a celebration and not a lamentation. Yes. Yes. You know, we, we mourn and we weep when our loved ones pass away, and that's natural. But we don't do it as the Gentiles do. We have something to rejoice in Jesus Christ. And in my homily this afternoon, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts that I hope will help to energize, encourage all of you as we look forward to the day when we shall join our beloved friend and brother in the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, death does not have the last word. Come on now. But Jesus has. And for that reason, I bring you a message of encouragement, of hope, not a message of lamentation. When our Lord was on earth, he engaged many times in services like these, and one of the moments that I, will, that I remember as I went, as I studied the life of Christ, was his message to Martha and the rest of the family at the, at the passing of Lazarus. And at that moment, he said something that I want to include in our message for this evening. When he received the words of the passing of Lazarus, he said to the disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going to wake him up. John chapter 11 and verse 11. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. I'd like to suggest this, evening, this afternoon that this is a representation of what's going to happen on that glorious day when Christ comes again, when he will bring to life those who have gone to sleep in Jesus Christ. I can imagine that he's going to, he has already said, Gordon has fallen asleep, and he will fall asleep and remain asleep until the great waking up morning. And when that waking up morning comes, he will hear the voice of the life giver and come to life again. A long time ago, when Robert Ingersoll, the, the um, self-proclaimed agnostic, died, at the day of his funeral, the program carried a simple statement that read, there shall be no singing. There shall be no singing. And the inference there is that singing is a symbol of celebration. But because I don't know where I'm going, because I believe death is the end, there shall be no singing. 
Not so with Gordon Martinborough. Not so with those who go to sleep in Christ. Because we know where we are going. And I have good news for you. Those who die in Christ deserve to be celebrated because they are going to be with the Lord one day when he comes again. And that causes singing, isn't it? So for this service here today, they shall be singing. And there was singing. And by the way, that last number was a hallelujah number. And that's the spirit that should characterize every one of these services when some child of God goes to sleep in Jesus Christ. Celebration of life. In my homily today, this afternoon, I'd like to share with you three reasons, simple, biblical, Christ-centered reasons why this service should be what it has already been, one of celebration. Number one, we celebrate the life and the ministry of a dedicated, loving, consecrated, progressive Christian leader. We are not here to mourn as those who have no hope, as we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 and 14. Rather, we are here to celebrate Gordon's vibrant life and his productive ministry. We celebrate his fruitful life of selfless service to mankind. We celebrate a life that has been a life of service and love to his family, to his God, to his church, and to the community at large. That's a life worth celebrating, isn't it? I've been so delighted as I listen to the many testimonies and eulogies given here today. Everyone has been focused on the positive contribution of this man of God. As a matter of fact, half of my presentation had to do with a eulogy of his life. But since I heard so many eloquent eulogies already, I decided to put aside the eulogies and just focus on the message of comfort and celebration for what God has done for this man who now falls asleep in Jesus Christ. We are here to thank God for giving Gordon to us for 84 wonderful years. We are here to celebrate him because his life has been packed with love and laughter. And by the way, I've never met another human being in all my life, and I've been down here for a long time. I've never met another individual who could laugh as Gordon did. What a laughter. And it could be identified anytime, anywhere, because it was unique. So I have good news for you, that it was a life of love, dedication and laughter, a life of worship and fellowship, a life of faith and duty, a life of battles fought and victories won. It was a life of living and giving, a life of caring and serving. As a matter of fact, as I reflected on the life of this beloved colleague and friend of mine, Gordon will be remembered as a caring pastor as an innovative and productive evangelist, as a wise, humble, and exemplary church administrator. May his tribe increase. And of course, one of the outstanding contributions he has made that has transformed so many lives is his Family Life Bible Seminar. Thousands of people in inter-America, North America and around the world have been blessed by this ministry. And I have a suspicion, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that one day in the kingdom of God, hundreds of people will come up to Gordon and say, it was you 
who invited me here because of this ministry. And so that's something to celebrate, isn't it? The second thing that evokes celebration is the, is the message that buoyed up the life of Gordon Martinborough. His entire ministry was focused on the blessed hope. As a matter of fact, I told him at one time that apparently he had, uh, he had uh, an obsession with the magnificence of the glorious return of Jesus Christ. He preached it everywhere. And the object of all of his doings, all of his activities focused on the blessed hope. So we celebrate the magnificence of his obsession with the blessed hope. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. What a beautiful statement, isn't it? So this was Gordon's magnificent obsession. He had a passionate love affair with the blessed hope. That's what he lived for. That's what he proclaimed. That's what he embraced. That's what he taught. That's what he believed. And I look forward to the day when he will hear the voice of the master say, welcome home, Gordon. Welcome home. Yes, this was his magnificent obsession. And it should be the Magna Carta of every believer here this afternoon. Amen. 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 This gives meaning to our lives and purpose as we face the future. I, I like the way that that beautiful song puts it, and, and, and uh, I refer to it as the national anthem of Adventism. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. And while millions out there today in this present civilization don't know where they're going and why they're here, we have this hope. Let's live for it as Gordon lived until Jesus comes again. So the blessed hope is validated by the good news of the empty tomb. I'm always fascinated when I read scripture. And one of the fascinating aspects of reading scripture is found in the book of Matthew on that memorable early Sunday morning as uh, two of Christ's female disciples approached the tomb they were met by a celestial visitor who said to them, he is not here, he is risen. What a message, isn't it? And the good news is that Gordon lived and proclaimed this very message, the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and because he lives, we too shall live. What do you say? And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And brothers and sisters, family members, while our friend sleeps, Christ lives. And that Christ is coming back again, and we shall live forever in his eternal kingdom. And I say to that, hallelujah. Yes, I want you to remember this. It's very, very significant. The blessed hope is the joyous reminder that death is neither final nor fatal. Where is everybody? Death is not a dead end street. It is not a one-way ticket to nowhere. Amen. Death does not have the last word. Jesus, the resurrection and the life, has the last word. Amen. And to those who sleep in Jesus, death is only the prelude 
to the symphony of immortality at the glorious return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want you to notice another text that I know Gordon loved dearly. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. And I read it for you. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud voice, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. I like to tell people at services like these that God always reserves first-class treatment for his children. Even after death, there is a glorious resurrection when they will be first. What a beautiful thought, isn't it? And so at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have gone to sleep in Jesus will have the precious, joyous privilege of being resurrected. And they will live not for 84 years, not for 100 years, not for five decades, not for 200 years, but for all eternity. And one of my favorite authors, the best in the world, put it succinctly when she said that the life we shall live when Jesus comes again and brings about the resurrection of the saints will be a life that measures with the life of God. Wow, isn't that marvelous? That brings me to something else. And that's the third reason why this service is a celebration. First, the life and ministry of our beloved brother. Secondly, the joy of knowing that we have the blessed hope guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the third one is that we will all be together again in a land where God will reign supreme. And I call this the celebration of the day when God will make all things new. You know, the gray hairs will disappear. Come on now. All those things that are old now will disappear. John the Beloved adds this symphony of good news when he said in the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Waveney, rest of the family, no more weeping. Hallelujah. And then it goes on to say here, and there shall be no more death. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Then it goes on to say, no more dying, no more crying, no more aging. And I love this one. No more aging. No more aching. No more parting. No more COVID-19. No more mask wearing. No more distancing. Hallelujah. And in the land of no more, by the way, I prepared a series of sermons entitled No More. What a day it will be when we reach that land of no more, where we shall be again in the bloom of youth as God intended for us in the beginning. Yes, in the land of no more, there, will, there shall be, all things will be made new. New men, new women, everything about us will be new. And I like what Scripture teaches us here, that this immortality will be granted to us. Immortality will replace mortality. Health will replace illness. Perpetual youth will replace old age. And I'm so glad for that one. 
Gladness will replace sadness. Beauty will replace ashes. Peace will replace war. And the inhabitants shall never say, I'm sick. What do you say, Clive, folk? Praise the Lord for these promises. In concluding this message, and I promise that I would not use all the message I have, because if enough is sufficient, more can't be better. <laughs> but in concluding, in concluding this, this brief presentation here uh, of why we should celebrate in services like these, finally, I, I want you to notice here that on that waking up morning of the blessed hope, when God makes all things new, Gordon and all God's sleeping children will live again. Come on now. All God's children and Gordon will laugh again. And I'd love to hear him laugh again. And it's going to be with a lot more energy than he had down here. And Gordon and the rest of God's saints will laugh again. They will love again. They will sing again. They will fellowship again. They will worship again in the land in which we shall never grow old. Wow. And then I, I like the pen portrait painted by this amazing um, Bible prophet, Isaiah, describing what that day is going to be when all God's sleeping saints are gathered home. And he says, The ransom of the Lord will enter Zion with singing. With what? Singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. What a day that will be. Now, folk, Gordon is okay. He is asleep in the Lord. He is done with the troubles of this world. But we today must reaffirm our faith in the God that motivated, guided, prospered, and blessed this man in his ministry. Be faithful to God so that we'll have the joy of meeting with him on that beautiful day just described in Isaiah 51 and verse 11. Furthermore, I conclude with these words. It is a song written touchingly, describing what it's going to be like when the life giver comes in glory. Oh, what joy will fill that day when with the voice of the proudest father, I will look at, he will look at us and say, Welcome home, children. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. This is the place I've prepared for you. Welcome home, children. Now that your work on earth is through, welcome home. Welcome home, children. Where I am, you will always be rejoicing forever with me. What a day that will be. And I want to ask this question this afternoon. We've been here for a long time this afternoon. I wonder how many friends, family members would like to join me in saying, God has blessed and prospered this beloved friend of ours that is now asleep. And we want to reaffirm our faith in the God who led his life throughout these decades. And you would like to join me in saying, by the grace of God, we will live and work and pray and worship and fellowship in a manner that will enable us one day, by the grace of God, to see our beloved friend once again and live forever in that beautiful land. I wonder how many would like to say, wonderful. So I conclude, in the joyous anticipation of the grand waking up morning, I join all of you, family members, 
and friends in saying, Good night, dear Gordon. Good night. Sleep on and take your rest. We loved you dearly, but Jesus loved you best. Good night. See you in the morning. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. What a wonderful word that was. Our hearts were touched by the Spirit of God. I can imagine that Isaiah must have been writing uh, to the families gathered here today celebrating the life of our beloved brother. Isaiah says in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will keep you. I will uphold you with the right hand, my righteous right hand. And so as we pray, as we conclude this service today, we are sure that God's Spirit, who was with us, is with us. And so I invite us all to bow our heads as we, as we pray and ask God to continue His good work. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, the God of love, the God who cares, the God who creates, and so he did 84 years ago when he created a baby boy named Gordon O. Martinborough. What a blessing he was in that home in which he was born and created. But, oh God, he grew. And he grew and he grew and and like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He was nourished by your word, inspired by your spirit. And oh God, he has touched thousands of lives because you touched his heart. And so today we celebrate his life. We thank you. We praise you, God, for sharing your son with us. And oh God, today we pray that your spirit will continue to abide with each of us in a very special way. We pray that you will comfort his dear wife, Waveney. Pray that you'll put your arms around Esther and Marco, that you'll hold them close that you reach out and whisper in, in Sammy's ear that, Sammy, I am your father. That Johnny will hear the thunderous voice of a loving father saying, I love you, Johnny. And that his sisters will feel his warm embrace. His brothers-in-law will understand your, your grace once more as they reflect on his life that nieces and nephews and cousins and all of us gathered here today will be reminded that one of these days you are coming there is no doubt that you will come because you said that I go to prepare a place and if I go to prepare a place I will come again and so, God, today we rest in the assurance of your word that you are coming again. And we know that when you come, 
those of us who would have died in you those of us who would have been living for you that we will be caught up together forever to be with our Lord and Savior in the midst of that celebration will be Gordon O. Martin Borough oh God I pray that you will continue to remind us of his memories of his conviction of his faithfulness of his love and of his care and may those memories be mo moments of inspiration for us and oh God we pray now that your Holy Spirit will continue to abide with each of us and will remind us ever so often every day of our lives that you are with us and that you will never leave us nor forsake us for these blessings we celebrate this moment and we thank you dear God for the life of Gordon Omar Martin Barrow and we pray that you will continue to encircle us with your love for we ask these mercies in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the precious Holy Spirit and in your name we say Amen and Amen and Amen. We would like to give special thanks to all of those who came today um, to support our family in a very real way. And we want the family to know, Sister Esther, uh, Brother Marco, um, Sammy, and uh, Johnny, that Sister Martinborough, because of the, the, the love that we have at Mount Olive Church for her, I hope she don't lock the door and keep us away because we have a way of getting next to you. I know that. And so you will never be alone because you have a church family who is going to, as a matter of fact, I think they've already begun to bug you, but it's, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. All right. So we want you to know that as well. Just a few uh, brief announcements. We want you to be mindful of our COVID restrictions that we have that you, as you exit, to please keep your mask on. Uh, we're asking for no hugging. I know that's going to be hard for black people, but <clears throat> nevertheless, we're asking that you help us, that we don't congregate. That's also hard for black people. Um, also, at the end, the family has provided some snacks for us. So as you pass out there, you will see out in the, in the lobby that there is bottled water and a nice patty for you as well. We ask that you please um, uh, take that with you. Um, if you haven't signed the register, we ask that you please sign the register as well because the family would like to uh, especially speak to you on a personal, on a more personal basis. I am asking at this time, I think Dr. Giddens, um, you can come, but um, we're going to ask um, as we, after we close, that our pallbearers get in place so they can come and join us as well down front. Uh, then we'll have our benediction and we shall leave. So pallbearers, would you come and get in place? We ask Highland to come as well, Dr. Giddens. Yes, thank you, Pastor. And um, Pastor Weir and I really appreciated being able to serve the family today and um, we are grateful to the family for inviting us to officiate in this manner. I just, I think most of us know everyone who officiated their names and titles were indicated in our programs. The two ladies who sang 10,000 Joys just before the, um, just before our eulogy by Dr. Brown, they are from San Diego. If any of you, if any of you needs their, anyone needs their, in, their information, you can call me and I can make that available to you. Um, if it costs a small fee, it's not on them. <laughs> but 
Lord. They're, they're Esther's good friends and they, um, they sing together also. They provide ministry in music and so they came down. I just wanted to make sure you know that. I think everyone else is known by every one of us and we're grateful to God for the opportunity to be able to be here to officiate today and to serve the family. We're going to ask the family to please remain with us in the foyer for a few moments after everyone passed out. Shall we stand for our benediction? Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. To the only wise God, our Father, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. We ask these blessings, amen and amen.
late Gordon Ornsley Martinboro was born on November 12, 1936, in the colony of British Guyana to parents Maisie and Gordon Martinboro Sr. The eldest son of a policeman and an industrious homemaker, Puxy, as he was known in his childhood, grew up in a humble yet stable home. His sister Shirley remembers her older brother as caring, but tainted by the common mischievousness of boyish childhood. Yet, he was exceptional in his pursuits of a relationship with God and intense in his devotion to prayer, biblical and academic scholarship, evangelism, and a mission. Gordon's affection for church work and ministry blossomed in his teenage years as a member of the Boxton Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here, he served as a leader of the local Missionary Volunteer Society, a capacity that developed his skills as an organizer and church leader. He purposed to enlarge the territory of his preparedness for the master service, and his teachability abetted this well. In 1959, a young Gordon Ornsley Martinborough and his best friend, Roy Israel McGarrell, demitted the teaching service together and enrolled at Caribbean Union College to study for the gospel ministry. Predictably, Gordon took with him a steadfast fidelity to finance and was determined to succeed with the help or above the hindrance of his instructors. His commitment to an active prayer life did not suffer the pressures of study. His comrade Roy remembers of their college years that they would habitually rise at 5 a.m. when the sleep was sweetest to go to the old broom shop to pray. With the winning combination of such faith and hard work, Gordon did exceedingly well in his studies at CUC so that he was selected as the valedictorian of the class of 1961. It is at CUC too that he was drawn to Waveney Hines, who reciprocated his interest. Deep love and friendship resulted, and in 1963, they were married and remained happily so until the time of his passing. Gordon and Waveney Martinborough were soulmates and partners in parenthood and in ministry. Pastor Gordon Martinborough's denominational career has been inspiring and impactful. He has served in various capacities at various rungs of the structure of the World Church, resolutely maintaining a passion for evangelism and keeping a wide berth for mediocrity and the ease of ordinariness. In 1980, he was selected as the president of the Guyana Conference. Then, following an outstanding term as personal ministries director of the Caribbean Union Conference, or CARU, he was elected to its presidency in 1991. As president of the Caribbean Union Conference, he assumed the chairmanship of the Board of Trustees of Caribbean Union College. In this capacity, he and Executive Secretary Dr. Peter J. Prime worked with the administration of the then college president, Dr. Sylvan A. Lashley, to persuade the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to forgive an insurmountable 12 million TT dollar debt that encumbered the college. Under Pastor Martinborough's chairmanship and Dr. Lashley's presidency, the enrollment at CUC grew from around 300 students in 1991 to an excess of 1,000 students in 1995. Residential accommodation for students was expanded, the science complex was completed and furnished, and the university auditorium was relocated to a far more commodious space at the present site. Do you know that every day at noonday, he would call me to pray for the campus? This made an indelible impression upon my mind. He displayed a high sense of trust and faith. I, Dr. Martinborough championed family life as a ministry along with Mrs. Martinborough, and this became a part of my leadership practice. Thank you, Dr. Martinborough, for your triumvirate example of prayer, faith, and family, and has shaped my own ministry of practice and has become your gift to leadership in the Adventist World Church. Pastor Martin Burrow was a brilliant spiritual giant who stood head and shoulders above other spiritual giants. He was intimately acquainted with God through study of the Word of God and was perpetually finding new and inspiring ways to proclaim the gospel to the world. In 1995, Pastor Martin Barber rose to the Inter-American Division, where he served in various roles, including Associate Ministerial Secretary, Vice President, Division Evangelist, and Co-Director of Family Ministries with his wife, Waveney. 
throughout his meteoric flight of promotions, his passion for soul winning and developing superior implements for evangelism never abated. Gordon Martinborough was a thinker and a prolific writer who thought and wrote to his ministerial calling and practice. Consonant with this, he wrote and published several manuals, Bible lessons, seminars, and books on practical family life and health evangelism. His written works have been published in several languages and successfully deployed in diverse cultures globally. In 2005, he retired from denominational employment, but never abandoned his duty to Gospel Commission. He co-founded Happy Family Bible Seminars International with his wife, Wayton, and targeted the global community with their brand of practical family life and wellness. The programs they have produced for television have been aired regionally and globally on Free ABN, Safe TV, Hope TV, and LLBN. Pastor Gordon Ornsley Martinborough has led an incredibly inspiring life that has personified the mission and motto of USC as alma mater. He has modeled what an extraordinary servant of God to humanity looks like, and in his 84 years on this earth, has managed to go beyond excellence. For his life and work, the University of the Southern Caribbean conferred on this deserving recipient the Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa at its 85th graduation ceremony in 2018. The ultimate valediction for a life so richly lived composes a swan song of complex and variegated emotions. The melancholy of bereavement for precious loss commingled with the celebration of triumph, achievement, and completion. The administration, faculty, staff, students, alumni, family, and friends of the University of the Southern Caribbean deeply mourn the recent passing of the late Dr. Gordon O. Martin. We express our heartfelt condolences to his wife, Waveney, their three children, Dr. Esther Viamonte, Samuel and John Martin Morrow, their son-in-law, Dr. Marco Biamonte, his sisters, Dr. Shirley McGarrow and Mrs. Dolly Teixeira, and their husbands, Dr. Roy McGarrow and Mr. Clement Teixeira, respectively, and a host of cousins, nephews, and nieces, ministerial colleagues, personal and family friends. Another decorated soldier of the cross has been called home to rest after serving distinguished tours of duty in the master service. Psalm 116 and verse 15 instructs us that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his sins. The Lord counts it as precious that our beloved is finished with the troubles of this world. May the life of this exemplary alumnus inspire us to remain faithful until our Lord and Savior returns and establishes His kingdom that will last forever.